Bruchem Aboyim. We are now on the uh, next lecture on the concept of my thoughts. And uh, today I thought we'd talk about, there's a question that's asked all the time, why do bad things happen to good people? And it's a question everybody asks. So I propose that uh, the answer is that bad things do not happen to good people. But what does happen is sometimes bitter things happen to good people, but never bad. What does that mean, bitter? Um, imagine if a person has a pain in their uh, foot, and they take a capsule, and uh, with that capsule, takes the pain away from their foot. It's, is it, is, what is it? It's good. Well, what if there was no capsule, and that same medicine would have to be put on someone's tongue? the medicine would taste bitter. But your foot would still feel better. So the truth is, medicine, by its very nature, is not made to taste good unless it's a child's medicine. So it's not based on taste, it's based on results. So even though it's bitter, the end result is, is that it makes you feel better. The, the truth is, is that we only see a snapshot of the world. Uh, there's a there's a verse in Tehillim, if you see something long enough, you watch evil people. You'll see in the end they do not succeed, even though they look like they're doing quite well in the beginning. I uh, remember one time my wife, we, had, we picked out uh, wallpaper. And, you know, they have small splotches that you pick out from. So I picked out one wallpaper, which I liked very much. And when I came home that night and the wall was done... I looked at it and told my wife, call the guy up, have him take it down. It's ridiculous. Because there's one little piece that looked fine. As a wall, it just didn't make it. Imagine, if you will, that you would take a tribesman out of the uh, deep jungles of uh, Africa and bring him to an operating room. And there he would see a person surrounded by many people wearing masks and gloves and um, they would cover up his face, and he would watch all of this. And then to his horror, they would see them, someone take out a, a scalpel, a knife, and begin cutting, either removing an organ, a tissue, or a limb. You can imagine his horror, and he would run out from the room and try to get help and tell the people that he's running to that there's these sadistic people who are dismembering this person. And what he doesn't realize is that these people are not sadistic at all. They're really angels of mercy. What they're doing is helping this person, giving this person life. And in reality, we know that the Pasuk says, Olam chesed that the world was created for kindness. And a person needs to know that everything in this world is a reflection of the world above. And just like we as parents love our children unconditionally, the love that a parent has for a child is an amazing love. Even before the child's born, before we know what the child will be, the child doesn't have to prove anything. There's a love that a parent has for a child. And that's the same love that we have for, that God has for us. Our greatest prayer, the prayer that we say that has the greatest impact is a vinu malkeinu, our father, our king. And the, the thing from father precedes that of king. Because as a father, we don't need any zechusim. We don't need any merits. Just the fact that we are a child to him is enough. And everything in life one needs to know is weighed and measured. That nothing is an accident. And that there are two forms of uh, love that God gives us. One is the obvious love that is visible, that is kind, so to speak. And the other is tough love. And the truth of the matter is, is that tough love given by a parent is even harder for a parent to do than for love that is warm and, e and simple. In fact, one of the biggest problems with parenting is that parents try to be friends instead of being parents because they want to be liked. And they're afraid of saying no to their children. You know, it's interesting that, uh, imagine if you had a statesman 
who was on a very important mission to save a country, to save the world. And he had to hire a, a wagon driver. And the wagon driver picks him up with a wagon and a horse. So the statesman on this crucial mission, the driver and the horse are all going to the same place. The, the statesman is thinking about what he has to say, what he has to do to save his country. The wagon driver is thinking about the money he's going to make by taking the statesman to his destination. And the horse is thinking about hay. And they're all going to the same place, but with totally different goals. So in life, that's the same thing. Many times we look at the world and we see it as the horse. We do not see it on the same level as God. God has a purpose that's be, that we cannot comprehend. The horse does not know what the statesman is thinking about, nor does the driver, and cannot. There's no way for us. In fact, it's interesting. We talk about God judging us. In reality, it's we who judge God. But let me tell you a uh, personal story of, of seeing the hand of God. So there was an article, there was a story, this was written in the Jewish press. Happened to uh, my mother-in-law probably some 15, 20 years ago. When my wife and I got married, we weren't religious at all. In fact, she knew very little about religion at all, and her mother had given her very little religious background because she had very little religious background as well. And when we got married again, it was, uh, I didn't even know she was Jewish when we first started dating. So religion had no basis for it. But as the years went on, when my son was born, I became a Balchuva. And we started to get religious. Somehow, some way, it was interesting that my mother-in-law was watching our growth. And lo and behold, I found out that she was starting to light Shabbos candles. And you can imagine our joy when we found out that every Shabbos, Friday night, she was lighting Shabbos candles in her house. That she wasn't keeping Shabbos. She had a business that she ran out of her basement. There was an entrance from the street. But every Shabbos, religiously, she would light the Shabbos candles. And then she'd go down and do what she had to do. But the Shabbos candles were lit. And I was moved, deeply moved. And then we get a call on Matsoi Shabbos, right after Shabbos, with horror. And our mother-in-law told, told my wife that she had lit the Shabbos candles as usual and went downstairs. And when she came upstairs, after waiting on a customer, she opened the door and the whole kitchen was ablaze. And the fire department came, smoke damaged the whole thing. And I tried to joke with her a little and I said, you know, Ma, you'll have a nicer kitchen. But I have to tell you, in my mind, I had this discussion with God. And I'm saying to him, let's, let's understand this. I get the woman to light Shabbos candles, you burn down her kitchen. Why does that make sense? You know, you should have had her win a lottery. Something, something special, <clears throat> or at least nothing negative. But to burn down her kitchen for lighting, it's a Shabbos candles. If you're going to have something, you know, a cigarette, whatever, but Shabbos candles? The Shabbos candles burn down her kitchen? It was quiet. And I just thought to myself, Gam Zulatova. Everything is for the best. Whether I understand it or not, somehow, some way, this has to have a good purpose to it. But I have to be honest with you, I sure couldn't figure out what. And my mother-in-law went through the aggravation of working with the insurance company. And, but finally she settled up. And she started to, they did work on this new kitchen. And to my amazement, she continued to light Shabbos candles. She put them in the sink, but she continued to light Shabbos candles. And I was amazed. I'm not so sure that I would have continued to do so. But she did. And weeks later, we get a call, and then everything made sense. Sometimes God opens our eyes and lets us see the end of the picture. What had happened was, when they moved into this house some years before, it was a two-story home, 
and they were living there themselves, and they wanted a big master suite, so they took out the wall between two bedrooms. And over the years, a crack had developed in the ceiling that was over their bed in this master suite. So we all have this in our houses. In fact, sometimes when we go to sell a house, we fix everything up that we meant through all the years that we lived there. We don't want to move anymore because now the house is really together. But we have little things here and there that it just doesn't pay to get a contractor in and cost a fortune to do. But when we do have a contractor, then we have him fix this, that, and the other, and he likes it too, makes some extra money. So while this contractor was in the house fixing her kitchen, she said to him, can you please go in my master bedroom and there's a crack in the ceiling. Tell me how much it would cost to plaster it and to repaint it. He said, sure. He came back not long afterwards and he was white as a sheet. And he said, Mrs. Race, I don't know who did that, but that wall, when they took it down, is right over your bed and the ceiling is getting ready to come down. And if you are in that bed when that ceiling comes down, it'll kill you. And she called and told us this. And I lifted my eyes to heaven and I said, thank you. Because what didn't make sense, what seemed to be the most preposterous of all things, burning down this woman's t kitchen, in reality saved her life. God allowed me, allowed us to be able to see the end of the, of the story. And generally we don't get that. But it's our job to know and to believe without doubt that God is a benevolent Father and anything that happens to us, as difficult as it may be, can only be for good. And <clears throat> the first question that everyone asks you when you're religious about this is the Holocaust. And I come from two parents that are both Holocaust survivors. And number one is, there is no answer that will take away the tears. But I can promise you that anything that happens in this world, anything that's done by God has a positive purpose to it, whether we can understand it or not. They quickly tell a story of a man who was a um, judge. I think I told it last week, but it fits so well here. And he was suffered greatly, but he wasn't a righteous person. And he complained bitterly about his suffering. And on the day of judgment, when he stood before the heavenly court, and they sentenced him to purgatory, to hell, the angel said, but he suffered. Shouldn't that be weighed against his misdeeds? And the court said, of course it should. So the angels brought all of the suffering that this man did, and the scales tipped, tipped, tipped. And then they ran out of suffering. And the man still had more misdeeds than he had suffering. And he was sentenced to purgatory. And as the angel is dragging him off, he screams out to God, you couldn't make me suffer just a little bit more? Everything in life has a purpose. Nothing is without the purpose. And I think that next week, what we're going to talk about is pain. And to understand why pain exists in the world, what's its purpose? And again, is it good or is it bad? May God bless you all and thank you for coming and have a good Shabbos.